Last time on Graph Theory, we took a look at breadth first search and depth first search. But, you know, because of time constraints, we only had time to look at the algorithms themselves and sort of understand them from the point of view of the trace. In this particular episode, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more about just miscellaneous things regarding these two algorithms. So yeah, just take this as a random collection of information. You're watching episode 6 of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. So this episode comes to you in three parts. What we're going to do is first we're going to take a quick look at a different way to formulate depth first search and that is the recursive definition. Second, we're going to look at spanning trees, including how we actually add spanning trees into our algorithm. Finally, we're going to take a quick look at the time complexity of these two algorithms. So with that said, let's jump into part 1. First of all, I must confess that the depth first search algorithm you saw in the last episode is actually not the most common form of this algorithm. In fact, a lot of the time, depth first search is presented as a recursive problem. The reason why I showed you the non-recursive version of the depth first search algorithm is because it looks a lot more like breadth first search, and so we can sort of put the two side by side and compare. However, now that we are past that point, I can show you the depth first search algorithm, which looks something like this. As you can see, it is quite a bit shorter, it has done away with the stack, and it has entirely done away with the loop. All it needs to do is to make recursive calls to itself. In fact, the reason why we can do things this way is because recursion happens on a stack as well. We've discussed recursion in the past before, so I won't go into too much detail. All I need you to see is this pattern. Every time a recursive call is made, the rest of the algorithm waits until that call and any further calls it may spawn are complete. We're going to make use of this behavior to replace the stack in a non-recursive depth first search. And as it turns out, the amount of work done by the recursive version is the same as the amount of work done by the non-recursive version. We make as many recursive calls as there are vertices, meaning we actually put less on the stack. But as we are backtracking, we spend a bit of time waiting for the many loops to complete. And that's why at the end of the day, really the amount of work done is the same. For a full trace of the recursive algorithm, please click the link on screen. I also want to take this opportunity to thank YouTube user StunDude for helping me set my idea straight and to fix some issues originally present in this trace. Notice that the results we get aren't exactly the same as the non-recursive version, and this is due to the different order in which the neighbors are visited. If this is unclear to you, click the link on screen for the full trace. Part 2. Spanning Trees First and foremost, a very important note on spanning trees, and that is they are not unique. You've already seen breadth first search and depth first search compared to each other, and the spanning trees they've generated are not unique, they are different. Not just that however, you notice that I actually visit nodes in a particular order. Let's say I visit this node, I actually look at its neighbors in a counterclockwise order. So this guy always comes first then the next one, the next one, and the next one. And that is an order that I've arbitrarily picked. In truth, we have no idea how our nodes are sorted. Maybe they aren't even sorted at all, which is what makes the order random. In certain cases, particularly with depth first search, this gives you a different spanning tree. Of course, you probably already know this, but another factor is which node we start from. Depending on where we start, the spanning tree will also look different. So yeah, the point is spanning trees are not unique. In fact, depending on how your vertices are sorted, a spanning tree may not even be really predictable. But yeah, we don't really need to think too much about this because as long as a spanning tree spans the entire graph, then we have a spanning tree. Simple as that. So then the question is how do we generate a spanning tree? As you would recall from the trace, the only difference between you know just doing a search and generating a spanning tree is to simply connect nodes to the nodes that have led to them. In other words, what we need to do is to augment our two algorithms 
with a new array. And this array is called parent. It keeps track of the node that has actually led up to that particular node. For breakfast search, this is very trivial because every time you're at a node, you look around at its neighbors. Any neighbors that has not been visited, well, we'll visit them. So yeah, really all I need to say is every time I queue up a node, I must also set its parent to myself. Because of course, I'm the one leading to the exploration of that next node. When it comes to depth first search, it's a little more confusing. You see, if you remember from the trace, basically what's happening is we may actually push some nodes onto the stack, but by the time we get around to them, they might have already been visited because some other node has done it first. However, turns out that isn't a problem. The recursive formulation of depth first search is immune to this issue since each vertex is pushed onto the stack only once. But even an iterative version is fine. For iterative versions, the parent array can be written to multiple times for each vertex. However, the one that counts is the last one. Because of the way the algorithm behaves, the last time we push the node onto the stack is also the time that it is actually selected, so it all works out. And so that is how you implement spanning trees. Let's now move on to our third point. Time complexity, our old friend. Now, if you remember from, you know, other algorithms, time complexity is normally expressed in terms of n. And n, of course, being the number of input items we have for the algorithm. But when it comes to a graph problem, well, we input more than one type of information because we have both vertices and edges. That is why when it comes to expressing time complexity of graph algorithms, we don't express it in terms of n. We express it in terms of v and e, the number of vertices and the number of edges respectively. So let's try to analyze both breadth first search and depth first search at the same time, because of course, they do basically the same kind of work. Both these algorithms have nested loops. Let's try and understand each loop separately and then put them both together to form our final time complexity. What the outer loop does is clear. It must run until the queue or stack is empty. In other words, all this loop is doing is visiting every vertex once. Therefore, the outer loop runs in OV time. The inner loop is a little bit more complex. Its job is to iterate over every edge connected to the current vertex. This loop runs once for every iteration of the outer while loop. In other words, for each vertex, we must explore all their edges and we must do so for every vertex. The time complexity for this is not immediately obvious and can in fact be different in different situations. For example, if the graph is complete, in other words, every vertex connects to every other vertex, then each vertex has V minus one outgoing edges. In that case, the time complexity of the entire algorithm is O V squared. Apart from the graph's properties, the data structure used also plays a part. For example, if you use something inefficient like an adjacency matrix, then the time is OV square as well, because every time you need to look up the neighbors of one vertex, you have to check it against every vertex in a graph to see if an edge exists between the two. The reason why we can say OV square in these two situations is because we can express the number of edges E in terms of the number of vertices V. However, in a general case where we are not sure how E relates to V, we'll have to think of it independently of V. Luckily, that's not too hard. Let's look at this graph. Let's draw out the process of each node visiting every one of its neighbors in two different colors. You'll see immediately that some edges are visited twice because each edge is connected to two vertices. In fact, every single edge is visited twice. This means that the total amount of work done by the inner loop is 2e or OE for short. To get a final time complexity, we simply add the two together. We visit every vertex once, and in total, we visit every edge twice. That gives us O V plus E as the final time complexity for both breadth first search and depth first search. Now at this point, you'll probably ask, you know, why do we have a plus in our time complexity? Don't we normally just keep, you know, whatever term dominates? Well, 
In this case, it's because we have no idea whether the number of vertices or the number of edges actually dominate. And as a result, we have to keep both terms. Anyway, that's all for this episode. This also wraps up all our discussions for breadth first search and depth first search. Next episode, we move on to Prims and Kruskal's, another two algorithms that are more or less basic, but one step up from BFS and BFS. So I hope you're looking forward to that. That's all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.